Hi there, today we are going to be talking about shoulder anatomy. We're just going to be changing gears a little bit here, going from the knee to the shoulder, and uh, hang out for a little bit, and uh, we'll show you what it's all about. Welcome to Ortho Eval Pal, where we help you build confidence in your orthopedic evaluation and management skills. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 12 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. My name is Paul Marquis, your host, and today I hope to be able to uh, start you off on a journey of understanding the shoulder a little bit better. We're going to be talking about shoulder anatomy today, and I was really contemplating this before doing this podcast, wondering, is it even possible to start talking about shoulder anatomy through a podcast? Uh, it's such a complex joint, and I was just trying to figure out, you know, is this going to make sense or not? But really, I'm going to be speaking to all of you folks who have been in the medical field, your PAs, NPs, PTs, OTs, maybe assistants uh, for each of those, and uh, physicians, we're looking at athletic trainers, and all of you folks have had some exposure to anatomy. And so we're not going to get into real technical anatomy, but I thought what I would do is talk to you about parts of the shoulder anatomy that are, are important things that you need to remember and um, we're going to be breaking the shoulder down into throughout many episodes uh, on our podcast uh, series and then we're even going to be doing some uh, webinars and uh, hopefully some uh, live courses at some point so today what i want to do is really just start off by kind of understanding the shoulder a little bit better and then we'll get into uh, more technicalities in some future episodes so First thing I want to talk about today is the, the glenohumeral joint, okay? So the, the shoulder consists of four different joints, the glenohumeral joint, the sternoclavicular joint, the AC joint, and the scapula thoracic joint. Some we obviously see more problems with in the clinic than others, but we'll talk about each of those a little bit just to kind of break them down some. Then we'll talk a little bit about muscular structure and uh, some tendinous issues, uh, biceps uh, tendon and the uh, glenohumeral capsule. We'll also talk about the glenoid labrum today. But what I am not going to talk about are the upper trapezius, the deltoids, the triceps, the lats, the teres major. We're not going to be talking about these large muscle groups, primarily because it is very, very seldomly do you ever see problems with those muscle groups. Now, they are very important as far as how the shoulder functions, but there are other areas that I think that we really need to hone in on a little bit more just so that we can be, become better diagnosticians of the shoulder. So today, let's start with the glenohumeral joint. Okay, now you got to remember that only about 20% of the, of the humerus contacts the glenoid at any one point. So it's really inherently unstable. It's kind of like a golf ball on a golf tee. If you um, stand it right up straight, it holds itself nicely. But if you tilt the tee over, uh, you're gonna, the ball's going to fall right out. So it's inherently unstable. One thing I want you to do while we go through this podcast also is kind of visualize this stuff. Obviously, if you're on your bike listening to me or in your car, don't close your eyes. But I really think that if you uh, go back to your anatomy, listen to what I'm telling you today, this will all come uh, to you pretty easily. So you have this inherently unstable glenohumeral joint, only 20% contact, falls out of the socket really easily, and it really in any position. So think about it, when you're standing, that humeral head wants to fall out of the glenoid. If you're laying on your back, it wants to fall out posteriorly. Laying on your stomach, it wants to fall out anteriorly. Uh, so in order to have stability to that glenohumeral joint, you need a lot of muscular function to help hold it in place, along with some other structures that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, so the glenoid uh, consists of a nice articular surface where it contacts the uh, humerus, and that uh, articular surface, surface is hyaline cartilage, is nice and hard and solid, and gives us that real glossy, uh, smooth effect with a, ball on the, uh, with a ball and socket type of configuration. This allows the shoulder to move in multiple directions, okay, flexion, extension, horizontal, AB and AD duction, straight on, AB and adduction, internal and external rotation. So that is why this joint structure, the bony structure, is inherently unstable. It's just so that it can allow it to move so much more. All right. So from here, we're going to go to the sternoclavicular joint. Now, I don't treat this a lot, and I've been a therapist for 25 years. I've probably treated one or two with discomfort in that area. It's quite uncommon. But what I do like about the sternoclavicular joint is to find it anatomically so that you can start at that point, follow the clavicle, and then kind of move your way lateral over to the AC joint. 
Now, some folks will typically have arthritis in that sternoclavicular joint. It kind of comes along with costal chondritis. And so you may want to treat it to help decrease compression, which is usually caused by horizontal shoulder adduction. And um, by trying to keep the chest opened up a little bit more and then even uh, some modalities to help uh, decrease inflammation there. But other than that, we really don't treat it much. We use it as a landmark more than anything. Follow that clavicle out, and you're going to go right out to the AC joint. And this is a very important one to understand where it's located because it's quite a pain generator. It's held together with uh, some ligaments. And inside that AC joint, when you're really young, you have some cartilaginous lining. It's, it's, it's more fibrous than the glenohumeral joint, so it's not hyaline cartilage. It's more fibrous. And there's also a small disc that attaches to the superior part of that joint capsule and kind of hangs down into the joint. Now, this little... Uh, this little piece of disc does not really last very long. By the time you're 20 years old, it's usually pretty much broken down and degenerated. And that's the other thing you need to know about the AC joint is that it does break down really, really quickly. And it's one of the quickest joints in your body to break down. So it can become arthritic. It can develop, you can develop a lot of pain with it. And if you find it and palpate it and notice that there's quite a lump or a spur um, superiorly, you need to think that this spur is also being uh, formed inferiorly, causing some irritation to your rotator cuff. So when you see a spur there, you need to be a little attentive to this because you may have a mechanical irritation to your rotator cuff because of that. Now let's go on to the uh, scapula thoracic joint. This is a physiologic joint, and by physiologic joint I mean that the scapula basically sits over the thoracic cage and is suspended by muscular structure. So the way that muscular structure works is very, very important to help hold that scapula in place. You need to remember the glenoid is part of the scapula. So if your scapula is not in a good position, your glenoid is not in a good position. Therefore, your glenohumeral joint isn't going to function very well. So having good scapula thoracic strength and stability uh, and good positioning is very important. Don't uh, forget to have a patient take their shirt off, take a look at how that scapula is functioning while they're abducting and flexing that uh, shoulder. Take a look to see if it's sticking out, okay, because that can be an indicator of a long thoracic nerve problem or other nerve injuries that cause inappropriate movement there. So those are the four major joints of the shoulder. Now let's talk a little bit about the long head of the biceps. Now, you know, that crosses the shoulder joint. Let's use the landmark of the uh, bicipital groove, everybody knows where that is. Okay, that's where that long head of the biceps travels. You need to remember this. The medial side of that bicipital groove is your lesser tubercle. The lateral side of that groove is your greater tubercle. And there are certain muscles that attach there. We'll talk about those uh, in future episodes and maybe even a little bit later as we talk about the rotator cuff. Now, when we look at the uh, biceps tendon, there are two. There's a short head and a long head. The short one attached to the coracoid process, which is part of the scapula. And the reason you never see tears in the short head of the bicep is because it's at a mechanical advantage. Okay, it is just, it's nice and straight on. It doesn't go through any curves. It doesn't move a lot, but it's mechanically very efficient. Now, the long head of the biceps goes through the groove. It starts off as an extra articular structure and then goes through the joint capsule and then becomes intra-articular. That is very important that you remember that, okay? So if somebody has a joint injection, intra-articularly versus extra-articular, and they have a relief of discomfort, you can sort of sort out which um, aspects of the joint or which anatomy could be irritated here, okay? The other thing you need to know is that that long head of the biceps attached to the superior glenoid tubercle, all right, and also has fibrous attachment to the superior glenoid labrum, and we're going to be talking about the labrum in just a little bit. Uh, so the bicep tendon is a very big pain generator. You need to remember this because oftentimes patients will come see you and they have pain in that bicipital groove, causing them a lot of discomfort. Then you may have a follow-up with them, and they might have ruptured their long head of their bicep, and they feel miraculously better. And um, nowadays, even with surgery, rotator cuff surgery, some surgeons will prophylactically cut that frayed long head of the biceps and it gives them immediate relief. So you need to remember that. 
Now, as long as, uh, as while we're talking about that area, let's talk about the subacromial bursa. This bursa is kind of like, a, you know, I always thought it was kind of like a marble and that it was fluid filled sac that was in the subacromial space between the uh, humeral head and the acromion. But it really doesn't look like that. When you look at it on a cadaver, you take it out, it's kind of like a water balloon that has been emptied and you have these two rubbery structures kind of wrinkled and laying on each other and it's actually quite large. Now, that bursa is a huge pain generator. There are some surgeons who prophylactically take that bursa out and find that people have relief after surgery even if they can't repair a massive rotator cuff that they might have. So we do know that it causes a lot of pain. It gets inflamed along with the long head of the biceps and along with the rotator cuff. So it's hard to just say, oh, I'm treating this person for bursitis. Usually we treat them in combination, you know, bursitis, tendonitis, or tendinopathy. And so uh, I want you to keep that in mind that that is also a pain generator. It's very hard to palpate. You can't really identify it by palpating it. So uh, I want you to keep that in mind. Next thing I want to talk about is the rotator cuff. Now, again, I'm going to be doing other podcasts about very specific things like rotator cuff tendonitis and adhesive capsulitis and bicep tendonitis and all these things. So try not to take all this in. Don't let it confuse you. But I just do want to talk about the rotator cuff in a, in a couple of things that are very, very important is identifying which muscles they are and what actions they do. So Let's start off with the subscapularis. So we talked earlier about the lesser tubercle being medial to the bicipital groove. Well, that subscapularis is a very powerful internal rotator and it attaches to that lesser tubercle. So people who have discomfort at the lesser tubercle, they have pain with internal rotation while the elbow is close to the side. You need to be suspicious that they could have a subscapularis problem. Now, the subscapularis is a very important stabilizer of that humerus and the glenoid. So um, it is important that you identify if it is injured. Now, let's go on to the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus uh, sits in the supraspinatus fossa in the scapula. It helps to abduct the shoulder for the first 30 degrees. And it also helps with glenohumeral stability and also helps with humeral head depression. And that will be a talk in itself. Let's go on to uh, just posterior to the supraspinatus and we have the infraspinatus. The infraspinatus also attaches to the greater tubercle and it's a primary external rotator along with the teres minor which is just below that and that is also primarily an external rotator of the shoulder. All three of those, those last um, muscles attach at the greater tubercle so they help with um, some elevation of the arm and external rotation. So this rotator cuff is very, very important. It uh, not only does it help hold the humerus and the glenoid, but it helps to elevate the arm and it's the most important muscle group in the shoulder. Now we see probably more shoulder problems than any other diagnosis in our clinic here in Northern Maine. And one thing we find is that the rotator cuff is usually the one that is most involved. And I truly believe that if we could strengthen this rotator cuff appropriately at a younger age, we would have significantly less problems with the rotator cuff later on in life. But we will um, we'll talk about that a little bit more specifically in future podcasts. Next thing I want to talk about is the glenohumeral capsule. Now this capsule is a very fibrous tissue. It's kind of like a water balloon around your glenohumeral joint helps to hold the glenohumeral joint in place. It also has a synovial lining to it. So when that shoulder moves, it helps to produce a synovial fluid for inside the joint to help keep it lubricated. Sometimes this capsule can be too tight and sometimes it can become too lax. And we will talk about that also uh, coming up soon. Last thing I want to talk about in the shoulder is the, gleno, the glenoid labrum. Now this labrum is a piece of fibrocartilage. It's just like the meniscus in the knee. It helps to bring conformity of the humerus on the glenoid so that it helps to give it some stability, kind of like a, a, a teacup in a saucer and that saucer is holding, holding it in there a little bit better. Uh, a couple things you need to remember is that the labrum is not very vascular. And there is that biceps, long head biceps attachment on the superior aspect of it that can, that when that biceps is pulling at it inappropriately can tear the superior labrum. So they can be closely associated. So, and I'll even uh, talk to you about some special tests in future episodes about 
you know, what, what are the tests that I like to use that helps to identify some of these structures if they are damaged? So some of the future episodes we're going to be talking about will be adhesive capsulitis. We'll be talking about how to identify the difference between a rotator cuff tear versus just tendonitis or impingement. We're going to talk about glenohumeral arthritis and how you manage it. And how do you differentiate between glenohumeral arthritis and adhesive capsulitis, which can be somewhat difficult. Uh, but I want to make this really easy for you. So we're going to break this stuff down and, um, and, and make it you know, so that it's very understandable for you. The other thing we're going to talk about will be some bicep ruptures. Not only are we going to talk about them proximally, we'll talk about them distally, and we're going to discuss why it is so important to identify these appropriately. I'll give you some uh, little pearls that I've learned over the years and uh, on how to identify if it's a proximal or distal, and uh, that'll be really helpful. So um, if you want a copy of my podcast outline, for this show, which I think you should you should get because I have in there some anatomical pictures that go along with my outline. And I think you can look at that and that'll really help give you an idea of that shoulder anatomy. Kind of um, just kind of bring you up to snuff on what that looks like and what these different structures um, are. And then uh, in the future episodes, we're going to be talking about this a little more specifically. So make sure you stick with us because we have some more episodes to come. And... Um, the next episode will be on adhesive capsulitis or the frozen shoulder, which I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite episodes, and uh, I hope you have a great day. If you have any questions, contact us at orthoevalpal.com. Make sure you sign in, join our newsletter, and uh, you'll get all of these episodes as soon as they come out. Thanks. We hope you've enjoyed this video, and for more awesome content, go to orthoevalpal.com. Can't wait to see you there.